This week, Boeing signs a major agreement with IAM, meaning that the 737 MAX will stay in Washington. American Airlines goes bankrupt in shuffled management, and United Continental Holdings is now operating with FAA approval under a single operating certificate. I'm Ashley Hale, welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. And it got word late Wednesday night that Boeing had reached a comprehensive agreement with the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. The details are still a little sketchy, but the basics include a four-year contract extension that reportedly contains significant economic gains for workers and also includes Boeing's commitment to build the 737 MAX in Washington State. Boeing said that it, quote, assess the business case for locating production of the 737 MAX in Renton in light of the economics of a proposed new labor agreement and that the company is prepared to locate the 737 MAX production in Renton provided the economics contained in that proposal are achieved. Upon ratification of such an agreement by hourly employees, Boeing says it will make the necessary investment to produce next generation 737 and 737 MAXs in its existing Renton facility. The agreement gives Boeing at least four years of strike-free breathing room, and part of the deal reportedly will entail having the union seek the consent of the NLRB, who has decision-making authority for such a decision, to dismiss the complaint that the union made that ultimately started a massive political firestorm. IAM members are scheduled to vote on the new contract on December the 7th. It was not a good week for American Airlines. It was startling, if not a complete surprise, when AMR Corporation announced Tuesday morning that it had filed for Chapter 11 reorganization. The parent company of American Airlines and American Eagle issued a statement saying that the move had been taken to achieve a cost and debt structure that is industry competitive to assure its long-term viability. The filing includes the company and certain of its U.S.-based subsidiaries, including American and American Eagle. AMR says the American Airlines and American Eagle expect to continue operating normally through the process. As part of the transition, the company announced that AMR President Thomas W. Horton will add the titles of Chairman and CEO, succeeding Gerard Arpey, who informed the board on Monday of his decision to retire. An email forwarded to ANN Tuesday indicates that the 67 pilots, among others, who retired from American Airlines in November may become creditors in the Chapter 11 filing. ANN's Tom Patton has details. Ashley, we received an email Tuesday afternoon from a retired American Airlines captain who said that because of the way the airline's pension plans are structured, about 67 pilots who retired last month had become creditors to the airlines and would have to get in line to receive any payments like any other vendor. Our source, who wished to remain anonymous, told me on the phone that the pilots who participated in what's called a defined benefits plan are able to take a lump sum payment on retirement but that the funds supporting those payments are an asset of the airline and therefore are part of the bankruptcy negotiations. So the bottom line is that pilots who retired in October are fine, but those who retired in November may receive less than they were promised because of the bankruptcy filing, and it may take a long time for them to get it. And we learned that while the airline says it'll be operating normally, the company plans to park about 15 airliners and close bases in four cities under the restructuring plan. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Thanks, Tom. Later in the week, we received another email from a source inside American Airlines that said that any pilot that retired November 1st will get their promised lump sum payout. It is also possible that the pilot's defined benefit plan fund would not be considered an unsecured asset as part of the negotiation, but that is for the courts to decide. It's certainly a story that bears watching. United Continental Holdings announced Wednesday it has been granted FAA approval for a single operating certificate, another milestone in the integration of United and Continental Airlines. The two carriers went through a rigorous 18-month process of aligning operating policies and procedures to obtain the single certificate. United's pilots represented by the ALPA fought the imposition of Continental's training and cockpit procedures on pilots flying for United but they lost in a U.S. District Court. So Air Traffic Control Communications now refers to all United and Continental flights as United. 
Robert L. Sumwalt was sworn in Tuesday to his second five-year term as a member of the National Transportation Safety Board. His term of office will now run until December 31, 2016. Sumwalt was first named to the board in 2006 by President Bush and served as vice chairman for a two-year term. He's currently serving a five-year term which would have ended on December 31st of this year. You're watching Airborne. More in a moment. Avidyne is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy-to-use avionics. And the new IFD 540 GPS Navcom sets a new standard for simplicity in communication and LPV navigation. As a slide-in replacement for existing 530 series navigators, and with a highly intuitive touchscreen control, the IFD 540 makes it much easier to access the information you want when you want it, reducing head downtime and making flying more enjoyable. Finally, you have a choice, and the choice is easy. Avidyne. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. The FAA has posted a flight advisory alerting pilots in much of the southeast U.S. that GPS interference testing started December 1st. The testing may result in unreliable or unavailable GPS signals. The test will be centered off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida. Each event may last up to 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes off. More than one event may occur during the published times. The testing is scheduled between now and December 12th, between 2100 and 0245 Zulu, or 4 p.m. to 945 p.m. Eastern Time. A 300 nautical mile radius will be affected. Find this map and more details in the text version of this story, dated November 30th at aero-news.net. Pilots are strongly encouraged to report anomalies during testing to the appropriate center to help determine the extent of GPS degradation. You should check NOTAMs frequently for possible changes. A Eurocopter AS350B2 helicopter being used to help erect a seven-story tall artificial Christmas tree on the waterfront in Auckland, New Zealand Tuesday morning was involved in a spectacular crash seen live on a web video stream. The pilot apparently descended close to the display's core tower to allow a ground worker to pull on a stuck load cable, but that worker inadvertently pulled the slack portion of the cable into the main rotor, and the machine was torn apart in an instant. The pilot, identified as Greg Gribble, walked away from the wreck with the assistance of two ground workers and was treated and released by Auckland Hospital. The artificial tree is to feature 375,000 lights and incorporate a feature which allows viewers on the internet to program it with their own lighting sequences. As previously reported, the U.S. Air Force's Block Talker Beechcraft from bidding on a contract to build its new light air support plane, and many days later still seems unwilling to explain their actions. ANN's Jim Campbell has more on this troubling story. Thanks, Ashley. The reason for a critical decision by the U.S. Air Force remains a mystery, and it's got much of the military aviation community talking, especially in Wichita. Hawker Beechcraft received notice November 21st from the U.S. Air Force, notifying the company it was being excluded from the bidding for a new light air support plane based on its otherwise well-regarded AT-6 program. The company says there's no explanation provided, and despite numerous requests, none's been forthcoming. Further, the Air Force has not responded to ANN's request for background as well. With only one bidder left in the mix, it's not clear why the Air Force is essentially handing a billion dollar contract to HBC's foreign competitor, Ember Air, in a time when U.S. unemployment is high and Ember Air is under scrutiny for arms deals with Iran. Hawker Beechcraft says it and its partners have already spent $100 million in development and continues to ask the Government Accountability Office to launch an official review of the Air Force's decision. Still, the Air Force isn't talking. Not to HBC, not to lawmakers, not to those with jobs on the line, and certainly not to ANN. Frankly, we're a bit mystified, and whether it's political payback for some of HBC's statements about the administration's treatment of the aviation community or something a bit more benign, we simply can't understand why the Air Force has had a case of dry mouth that's pushing two weeks in duration. Either way, we'll keep you updated. For Aero News, Aero TV, and of course, Airborne, I'm Jim Campbell. The UK Ministry of Defense has finalized a deal to sell as many as 72 surplus Harrier jets to the US Marine Corps for use as spare parts. 
The U.S. Department of Defense will pay $180 million. Reuters reports that the ministry canceled the Harrier program and retired the fleet as part of a major cut in defense spending last year. The move was said to be a factor in BAE's announcement that it plans to cut up to 3,000 jobs in Britain. Barnstorming is the name of Jim Campbell's popular editorial commentaries that appear online on the Era News Network. This week, we have a bit of a surprise for you. As you may recall, several weeks ago, a and Jim Campbell and AOPA boss, Craig Fuller, sat down for a long, frank, and very cordial conversation. It must have gone well since the first person to take us up on our offer to contribute to Barnstorming is none other than Craig Fuller himself. His first appearance on Airborne, Craig addresses AOPA's ambitions for the coming year. Well, Jim asked that we talk a little bit about what we're focusing on in 2012, but first, I want to compliment Jim, Aero News, and the entire crew for Airborne. It's an exciting new uh, video publication that we look forward to participating in from time to time. You know, 2012 sets up to be a critically important year for general aviation. First and foremost, it's a national election year, and that means all 435 members of Congress, one-third of the Senate, and of course the President of the United States is up for re-election. Uh, we ask a lot of these elected officials, they frankly ask a lot of us, and it's important for all of our aviators to get out and engage in this process in 2012. I think the other initiative that we really want to focus on is a continuation of our work in flight training. We simply have to get better at bringing more people into aviation. So look for us to talk about that right at the first of the year. A lot of the same issues will be back. I expect the user fees will be back in the president's budget. We'll be battling that. We'll be battling taxes at the state level. Of course, making sure that anything that's done to require avionics in our cockpits recognizes the substantial investments we've already made as next gen is considered. But uh, we'll be back to talk about these and other issues often. Again, congratulations, Aero News, and uh, we sure appreciate the chance to participate in Airborne. A few things are still up in the air as far as Boeing and Wichita are concerned. Boeing has let the aviation world know that it's evaluating the future of its modification center in Wichita, Kansas. Following the announcement, elected and union officials requested a meeting with the company. They say Boeing made promises to put jobs in Kansas and it should be awarded the KC-46A contract in the Air Force, which it was back in February. But the Wichita Eagle reports that according to Kansas Governor Sam Brownback, there is no written agreement or contract requiring Boeing to stay open in Wichita. The company's announcement says it anticipates completion of its Wichita study by the end of the year or in early 2012. In just a moment, our Aero Video of the Week will take your breath away. I'm Ashley Hale and you're Airborne on Aero TV. Redbird Skyport is a multifaceted aviation laboratory charged with developing innovative solutions to the issues facing the industry. It started out as a vision for a laboratory where we could objectively measure the systems and the processes that we were developing. Being able to put some objective measures behind the anecdotal evidence that we have about the value of motion and the application of this technology is very, very important because until we can objectively measure it and play that data back, we can't design training systems that make the best use of it. For more information about Redbird Flight Simulations, as well as Redbird's new Skyport, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com or www.redbirdskyport.com. Thanks for joining us this week. Each week we share with you a sample of an online video that one of our viewers thought was especially entertaining. We call it AVW, the Aero Video of the Week. This week, he's known as Jetman, a.k.a. Eve Rossi. And you may have seen video of his flights using a strap-on wing powered by four small jet engines. But in a recent demo flight, he spent 10 minutes flying in formation with a pair of L-39 fighters. To 
find this video, go to the Breitling website at www.breitling.com. If you've seen a video you'd like to have us consider for the AVW or to suggest a story for Aero TV, the Aero News website, or our podcast, send us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. The NTSB has released its preliminary report on an accident that occurred October the 17th that killed Oklahoma State's head women's basketball coach and one of his assistants, as well as a former Oklahoma State senator and his wife. The plane went down in a heavily wooded area of the Washita National Forest, about eight miles southeast of Perryville, Arkansas. Witnesses say the plane was flying at a low altitude and making turns, then entered a steep nose-down attitude before hitting the ground. Weather was reported VFR with light winds. The pilot was former state senator Owen Brandstetter, who was also a CFI. The FAA has granted an STC to Harrison Arrow for the Commander 112 and 114 elevator spar cracking issue that prompted an airworthiness directive. It allows the fleet of commander owners the option of repairing rather than replacing their spars and reinforces the spar near the hinge area to prevent future cracks. Find details at harrisonarrow.com. A link to info on the STC is right at the top of the homepage in bright red. NASA began a historic voyage to Mars with the launch of MSL, the Mars Science Laboratory from Cape Canaveral. The spacecraft carries a car-sized rover named Curiosity, which will spend nearly two years investigating whether the region has ever offered conditions favorable for microbial life, including the chemical ingredients for life. Because it literally weighs a ton, Curiosity is too heavy to employ airbags to cushion its landing, as previous Mars rovers have done. A rocket-powered descent stage will lower the rover on tethers. A similar technique may be used for human Mars missions in the future. United Launch Alliance says it has passed a design equivalency review for the Atlas V, a rigorous assessment of vehicles' compliance with NASA human spaceflight requirements. Three of the four current NASA commercial crew development partners have selected the Atlas V as their launch vehicle. Because Atlas V is already certified to fly complex exploration and national security missions, the need for a lengthy and risky development program is expected to be avoided. One of ANN's favorite events each year is our annual trek to the Inner Service Industry Training Simulation and Education Conference, or ITSEC the mecca of military simulation and education technology and innovation. a and Jim Campbell checks in from ITSEC in the left seat of a C-130 in flight. On the floor of the 2011 Inter-Service Interagency Training Simulation and Education Conference, or ITSEC for short, you can see the amazing amount of technology being fielded by today's military. What this is all about is finding ways to leverage technology from the standpoint of simulation and online education and using computer-aided uh, devices to be able to mimic, in many cases, even replace the real thing in so many roles in so many ways in, and, more important, do so cost-effectively, safely, and rapidly. The amazing thing about ITSEC, what people don't realize, is they look at a floor like this and they see amazing technologies, but they also see things that seem very expensive. Expensive? Maybe. Cost-effective? Yes. What we're seeing here is how we're leveraging the best and brightest of today's military technologies and finding ways to train crews in ways that we've never been able to do so before. We can take them not only to the limit of what these aircraft are capable of, but beyond, and do it in complete safety. And we can do it time in, time out, day in, day out, it doesn't matter. And on schedules that we can meet no matter what the weather is, no matter what the aircraft availability is, because today's simulators and today's technologies are available 24-7. And the one thing that I think the public really needs to know is that more bang for the buck is happening on the floor here than any place you're going to find. ITSEC is an amazing place to judge how cost-effective our military and our military vendors are trying to be in tough times. For the Aero News Network, for Airborne, and for Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell. Finally this week, the FAA has ordered airliners to remove the emergency oxygen generators in airline lavatories out of fear that they were, quote, easily accessible and could have been manipulated to create a flight hazard. 
The agency tells USA Today it made its decision in cooperation with the TSA and developing a secure replacement system could take as long as four years. In the meantime, we get to hold our breath, literally. According to FAA data, a passenger's time of useful consciousness is a decompression incident could be as little as a few seconds at 40,000 feet without supplemental oxygen. So if you find yourself in the bathroom when a skylight suddenly appears, better hope the pilot makes a steep dive and hold on. Get comprehensive real-time 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. And join us again next week for another edition of Airborne here on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.